Henry, this was a was a was an awesome presentation, and uh, maybe it's because of our age. Uh, I really enjoyed that uh, there was a more perspective in it, right? I mean, IoT is so overhyped in the last one or two years that we forget that IoT is not just something which fell out of the valley or, or out of the sky, but actually has been called M to M and has been with us for 20 years. And I really enjoyed that uh, some perspective there. <clears throat> when I have this talk in in the valley. Usually, I try to puncture uh, the bubble a little bit, but I have the feeling that maybe here uh, we can have a more rational debate about it. Um, the way I work is usually I like to have conversations uh, twofold. A, so I learn something. Second, I get mad to run around uh, and hand over the mic uh, and give him the amount of food he ate yesterday. I think he needs a little bit of uh, walking, so feel free to ask questions, uh, even interject and, and, and say, oh, well, what you're saying here doesn't make sense, and um, I have a better view of it. Okay, let's get started. Um, goal of this presentation is not to give you answers. What I hope to give you is some pointers, uh, some grounding in, in, in what we think uh, the, the reality is, um, and maybe give you some pointers you can look up uh, if you're interested and find out more. But just to kind of give you a, a base level that when people talk about IoT, that you have an idea about what that really means, as in particular from a technology stack and from a business side. So let's get started. Uh, I like this, um, this uh, picture. It shows, um, it's you know, quaint, it's almost like 90s. It's a university website. You know? On this side is things on the front page of a university website, and on this side is things people go to the site looking for. And as you noticed, the overlap is rather small, the full name of the school. And similarly in IoT, um, there is so much hype, so much marketing out there that it's almost hard to pierce through the fog of marketing and, and, and pitches and to, to understand what's really behind it, right? So again, I want to empower you to look a little bit through that fog and understand, you know, what are the trade-offs, what is there? Um, and I do know I have a harder time now um, because the, the talk about the oil field was about actual in the field M2M uh, communication, where some of the stuff people claim for IoT, for consumer facing IoT, actually is a real requirement, where some of the other stuff people claim for IoT uh, in the consumer space, I personally think is fluff and not worth your time actually investigating. Um, this is the idea how will the Internet of Things uh, shape API design? Um, let me start with a little bit of a business-like uh, approach. Everyone here, I assume, can build an uh, API within minutes, right? Building an API is not rocket science anymore. Maybe never was. Um, but there's a difference between building an API and doing an effective API. And what do I mean by effective API? I mean an API which meets your business objective. So it's not like you build it and they will come. Most of the time, they don't. So first, get clear on why you need an API. What is the business objective? And to help you think through that, I want to introduce you to something uh, we call the API value chain. Now, value chain is a, is a, is a common concept in, uh, business, uh, in, in the business world, right? It kind of shows how you start with something like a, like a resource and you add value to it until you have an end consumer paying for it, right? And the interesting thing in the, uh, in the API value chain, they always start out with a business asset, like that uh, rod, that radioactive rod, that uh, source, uh, I think it was called, right? That's a valuable business asset. You want to track that. Uh, it could be map data, right, like Google Maps. That's valuable data. But Google Maps didn't start out by someone saying, I want to build a map API, and I figure out what to, sh uh, what to show in that uh, API. Uh, secondly, no, it was like Google had all that data, and they said, how can we monetize that data? So everything starts from business asset. Then you have an API provider. That could be in control of the business asset, or it could not be. But the key is the API provider doesn't just deal with the API itself. 
No, it also deals with the SLA, with the end user license agreement. So there's more to it. There's a technical contract and there's a legal contract. And then the API provider doesn't talk to him. He talks to the developer, the developer who uses that API and is building an app or an, 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 an application or, or something with it. And then this application, he then tries to get the application in the hands of the end consumer, <clears throat> and the app is using the API, and then at some point comes the end user and using the API. Now, what do I mean by effective API design? It's essentially the relationship between the API provider and the developer, right? You need to design the API in such a way that the developer can do their job well to build an app which is meaningful to the end consumer. So think about that for a second, right? You're not building an API for the end consumer. The end consumer doesn't care about your API. He just cares about what he can do with the app using your API. So he needs to feel your love. And effective API design essentially means uh, we have in uh, usability, we have UX. And uh, my colleague, Ronnie, who we're going to talk later, uh, we're trying to establish a, a concept of DX, developer experience. So keep that in mind. Um, now, what does that mean, coming back, what does it mean in terms of IoT? So when you go you know, to the meetups, to the conferences, et cetera, you usually end up with like four or five points everyone seems to agree upon what IoT means, right? And you can go through, like low power. There's the presumption that whatever we do, it needs very low power. Um, limited bandwidth, there's the assumption that uh, you can send kilobytes of data, not megabits or megabytes or, or gigabytes, right? Many messages, many small little messages. There are entire companies founded on that premise. I can send tiny little messages over uh, limited bandwidth on low power. Asynchronous, things are just happening, right? It's not like a request response model where you can ask, did the door open, did the door open, did the door open? No, it's like the door opens and you wanna be getting a message. So there's a different pattern. Uh, for those of you who have been around in the industry a little bit longer, there's nothing new, right? We have pop sub models in the, in the industry for a long time, especially in the financial industry, credit cards, et cetera, using MQ or active MQ, et cetera. So this kind of asynchronous messaging uh, is being, being assumed that that's gonna be the, the, one of the major interaction models in, in uh, IoT. Autonomous. That's an interesting, uh, interesting one. Um, there's a company out in the valley who is genius in getting you to dump your fully functional, fully workable iPhone 4, which you bought one year ago for 500, was it now $500, $600 uh, without contract, and get you to buy you a new one, a new iPhone, right? Uh, for the same amount of money. Uh, phone is still perfectly fine, but their genius in marketing is such that you want to have that new one. Now, if you're like me, now I, I know I'm German, I'm culturally biased towards a little bit, uh, not spending so much money, but you're not going to do that with your toaster. You're probably not going to do that with your refrigerator. I don't even think you're going to do that with your car. So what I mean by autonomous and long living is that as things get connected, you have to think already today about what is the average lifespan of that thing, right? It could be, uh, in, in, uh, when we talk about whitewares, like, like uh, washing machines, etc., we're talking about five, six years, easily. If you're looking at uh, something like Miele or, or some of the higher, bra higher brands, you're talking about 10, 15 years. Now think about that. What does it mean that you build an API with clients which are potentially not field upgradable, where you have to keep the API steady and stable and available for the next 10, 15 years. Because I bet you, if you're coming out with a product that a customer buys, and two years down the road you're saying, nah, let's forget that API, let's do something else. 
and the customer gets this little message, sorry, your, your, your uh, access to your API just expired. Uh, tough luck for you, right? He's not, never going to come back and buy from you, right? So there is, whereas before we kind of, when we did API design and, 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 and just writing software, we always assumed, well, we can just upgrade, right? Which was a fallacy already back then, but it even becomes more a fallacy once that software is sitting in a flash in the EEPROM in some kind of thing which people have in their, uh, in their, in their houses and they do not gonna uh, exchange. So autonomous, uh, maybe I should have ri written also uh, long living um, design. And then of course many connected applications and systems. So and if you're looking at the space now, there's like this Cumbrian explosion of technology, right? Uh, a lot of frameworks claim that they're going to solve all those problems for you. Uh, aware of peer-to-peer -peer technology, essentially creating a mash of, of mobile devices where you route hop by hop across connected uh, mobile devices to build kind of like a parallel network. Now, some of you might ask, well, what are doing Couchbase and Firebase in here? Uh, let me share you a little story. I went to, to a hackathon. Part of my job, uh, or part of the enjoyable part, is that I can go to those and uh, don't have to ask for permission. Um, so I was a mentor there uh, for APIs. And I stood there, you know, and all those guys, it was a mobile hackathon, they were all kind of hacking away. And no one came to me and asked me anything. Which, uh, A, uh, made me start think about, am I, am I still in the right business? Because obviously my skills seem to no longer be relevant. But B, what were they all doing? The mobile has to talk to something. So I, I finally grabbed a, a mobile dev guy and he says, APIs? Oh man, I'm not using APIs. I use CouchDB, I use MobileDB, I have my database on my mobile. There's an eventual synchronization happening with the backend, so I'm using this as a data persistence layer across um, sometimes connected systems. It's great, I don't have to deal with anything anymore. I have a database here, I have the database back there, and eventually they sync up and I get my stuff and I have a actually decent off, uh, uh, offline uh, behavior because I still have data on my mobile and it's not just hanging there trying to get to a server which happens to be on an interstate in, I don't know, I don't want to say Texas, maybe what, Oklahoma or something like this, where there's no connectivity. So, which is interesting because that means maybe APIs actually get submerged in some kind of data persistence layer which can survive uh, potential outages of connectivity. So this is why I put Couchbase and Firebase there, because that's their reason of being. And they're aggressively going after IoT and, 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 and other kind of use cases where maybe the thing is connected, maybe not, but it shouldn't matter on, on how you use it. So lots of frameworks, lots of protocols. So you thought the world is settled around HTTP. Um, there is a lot of marketing money thrown at you to convince you otherwise. And um, most of you probably know XMPP, right? The granddaddy of, of, of uh, chat. Uh, XMPP is actually doing very well in, in, in IoT because it's established. It has a very strong security uh, model built around it. We know it's scalable. The only thing it is, which people don't like, that it's XML. But if you get over that hump, Actually, XMP XMPP is a very decent protocol. Interestingly enough, a lot of the IoT network topologies look very much like chat topologies, right? You have presence, a thing comes on, a thing goes off. You can communicate with that thing, AKA some member of a chat community. Well, it's on, when it's gone, it's, you know, it's, uh, it buffers somewhere that the messages then reach it when it comes back online. Um, Another granddaddy, most of us uh, who are, actually most people who work in the industry probably know, it's called DDS. It's a very early pub-sub protocol. It's very big in uh, military and it's very big in medical uh, devices. They are now making a run and claiming we are the IoT protocol. Um, there is MQTT, open source by IBM, uh, heavily promoted by Eclipse, who is, has nothing to do with the old MQ, except for the same concept. It has similar, like, you know, deliver once and only once, deliver at least once. So it has like different classifications. It's a very slim protocol, pub sub protocol, 
which with all the IBM marketing uh, power behind it claims that they are the one IoT protocol you should only care about. Uh, uh, Co-op, there is a, you know, obviously ARM looked at what uh, uh, IBM did and said, well, we have to do something different. So there's a, uh, it's, a, it's, a uh, it's an official RFC now, Co-op. There's a direct mapping between HTTP REST and, and uh, Co-op possible. Uh, interestingly enough, there's an industry consortium now building around ARM, uh, focusing on pushing Co-op as the IoT protocol. Then we have WAMP, which is a very interesting protocol from the W3 uh, work groups. And um, just for good measures, there's a brilliant little text-based PubSub protocol called Stomp, which is just, I just love for its simplicity and brilliance. But I think what you start seeing here is already, right, there's an ARM camp, there's an IBM camp, somewhere there there's a Cisco camp, right? You see kind of industries aligning around protocols with the goal of being the next HTTP and kind of having a hold on your wallets and checks and IT investments. So just be aware of that, right? And there's obviously a lot of marketing, and so I captured a little uh, exchange here uh, between Joe Speed, former head of marketing uh, in IBM, now head of IoT at the Linux Foundation. Uh, he says, uh, and analysts like GigaOM are writing that HTTP-based protocols are a dumb way to do mobile apps, that MQTT is more reliable. To which Michael Holdman, who uh, is in the company who promotes XMPP-based uh, products, writes, I seem to think there were tons of articles touting OS2 as the OS of the future at one point. Amazing what unlimited supply of advertising dollars can get people to say. I'm not going to judge one or the other. I know both. Uh, actually, I like both. But it just kind of, when you read statements about IoT and this protocol and that protocol and forget HTTP and this is the brave new world, keep in mind, you know, follow the money. Sometimes it's very easy to see where you, you're being subjected to marketing messaging rather than technical, uh, uh, technical messaging. So even further... And now here's where, where I have a little bit of a, of a, of a tension right now, because obviously uh, we just saw real M2M on the field, on the ground uh, applications, which do have a lot of those requirements. But for most consumer IoT, I would question almost all of those assumptions. Is it really true that there's low power? Well, most of my things are within a meter, three feet of a, power, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a power plug or a power supply, right? Uh, an out, outlet, power outlet, sorry. Limited bandwidth. Well, where do, where do my things live? Most of the times they live within a Wi-Fi saturated area, be it here, be it in the office, be it in the coffee shop, be it at home. I don't think my thing has to cons be concerned about either power or bandwidth. Many messages, we can debate about that. It's essentially a design decision, in my mind. I do agree that asynchronous behavior will be predominant over request reply as we know today. And I do agree that autonomous, long-living system, that, that kind of uh, design uh, amplification there, uh, are relevant. Many connected application systems, there seems to be this orthodoxy assuming that everything goes to the cloud. Well, I don't know about you, but Really, do I need to have everything on the cloud? What happens if the cloud goes away? Uh, does it mean I can't toast anymore or wash anymore or, or, or do this stuff, right? Why can't this just be within my home? Why does it need to be the cloud? I don't know if you guys followed, right? Uh, one of the, uh, I think a Korean uh, TV manufacturer was just ding on collecting all your viewing behaviors and shipping it off for, for uh, analysis. I don't know if it was LG or, or one of one of. Samsung. And it's incredible. I mean, maybe you don't care, maybe I don't care, but at least I want to have a choice. I mean, what do they care about what I'm watching, right? But there's this orthodoxy repeating over and over again, IoT means something in the cloud, and then little dumb notes just pumping stuff up. And that may be true, 
but maybe it doesn't need to be true. It's your design decision. You as an engineer, you as product architects. Um, and I think the two things we should, we should focus on, where I see the impact on, on, on uh, IoT on API designs, is um, we can debate if it's called real-time APIs, pub-sub APIs, uh, asynchronous APIs. It doesn't matter. The point is it's not a request response pattern, but it's more like a, a publish subscribe pattern. Right? And I think you will see more of those kind of APIs uh, uh, emerging and technologies emerging. And those are the ones you should be paying attention to. And then I think long-living autonomous systems. Uh, we, have, we are fortunate to have Mike Amundsen. Uh, he's part of the API Academy. He's, for me at least, one of the fathers of hypermedia. So if you start thinking about long-living systems and thinking about uh, API design, do yourself a favor and start reading up on hypermedia or the real fieldings uh, uh, API. What that, in, in a nutshell, what hypermedia allows you is to build an API which is um, robust to change. So you can change the API after you release that. If the client is able to follow the hypermedia uh, 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 concept, the client can adapt. So you're not locked in with an API for the next 10 years you can't change. Yes, it means a little bit more investment on the client side. It means a new concept of following uh, relation tags instead of hard coding URLs. The good news is you can change that API. You get a degree of freedom to continue to innovate and, and, and do all kinds of cool stuff after that thing is in the field and maybe is not field upgradable. Okay, just a bunch of questions you can ask yourself when you, when you design your future IoT uh, killer product, home, office, or outside. I think I talked already, right? If you're in the home and the office, a lot of constraints fall away because there's a power outlet, there's Wi-Fi. If you're outside, you know, by all means, we're talking about SMS, cellular uh, coverage, etc. cetera. Uh, Sigfox, long uh, and, and, and extremely long range wireless standard, which is uh, very popular. Mobile or stationary, wearable or built in. Autonomous are always connected. These are questions only you can answer, but I just kind of want to give you some pointers there. This is my personal question I always kind of like to, to, to raise. And I, I can admit, maybe I'm culturally biased, right? I do not want to have a digital shadow for everything in the cloud. I do not. You have to decide for yourself if you need one. Um, implicit in a lot of this talk about clouds is that somehow sending data is always cheaper than calculating locally. Ask yourself that question. What gives better value to my customers? Sending it there or, or calculating it locally? Um, this obviously is... Uh, something which is hard to kind of justify or, 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 or talk about in, in like measurable technical terms. But what we notice is there is a reason why we are here at an API conference, right? Something in, about APIs worked, which didn't work with web services. There's no, there's no uh, SOA success story, uh, but there are API success stories, right? But there seems to be always this trend back to, oh, let me come up with a whistle for uh, APIs and then I can auto-generate my, my, uh, my clients, right? There's always this trend to, uh, oh, let's not design an API anymore. Let's just take my functional signature, turn it into something which I then can generate my, my uh, and we call it REST for whatever reason. Um, don't let that happen. That would be a tragedy. Otherwise, we are recreating the fallacies of the past of, of closely coupled systems which do not scale, which do not, uh, can, can be managed independently, etc. So APIs worked. APIs, web APIs. Simplicity, self-service, low barrier to use, access to valuable resources. So a lot of those frameworks we talked about claim convenience, but they give up on a lot of those uh, points, right? 
suddenly this whole API becomes like this, this opaque uh, mess again. No one understands what's happening underneath, et cetera. And um, I'm not personally a user of Evernote. I think they, they have a great product. But Evernote, for instance, doesn't have a web API. Ever, Evernote has a thrift-based API, a binary API. Go and look at their API description. It's functional. It's, it's function signatures all over again, right? It's like a, what, 50 to 100 different functions in order to, in, uh, to integrate something with Evernote? That's like SOA. Again, while that is possible, it did, the, if the path is any indication, that didn't seem to scale and didn't seem to kind of make an easy uh, adoption possible, right? So again, just don't throw API design out of the window because suddenly some magic framework appears and just kind of tries to take uh, that, make all that magic happen for you. Um, just a reminder, right, here, focus on him, what he needs. And uh, this is a little, little pitch. I don't know who, who knows job to be done, uh, that concept from Clayton Christensen. You guys know that? Okay, a few hands. If not, look it up. He has a great book called, um, well, obviously, he had the, his, his greatest book was Innovator's uh, Dilemma. But he actually thinks that his second book, which was written, The Innovator's Solution, which hardly no one knows, is actually the more important book. In that one, he comes up with ways on how you can avoid the innovator's dilemma. And secondly, he creates something called the job to be done framework. He says that people don't buy your product. They rent your product or buy your product to do a job. And for you to understand what job it is your customer wants to do enables you to build the right product so that your product is going to be superior to, to your competitors. So, Look it up. Uh, there's a hashtag JD, JTBD uh, or just job to be done, and there's plenty of, of material on the web. But I found it as a, as a kind of like guidance framework for what I should be building to be very, very relevant. And then ultimately, you know, yes, it may sound common advice, but again, you know, marketing money has a way of, of, of confusing things. Uh, pick your technology based on the job you're planning to solve not based on if it's sexy or gets you into conferences or, or anything else. Um, just some, exactly. <laughs> it, 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 some, some stuff does get you into conferences, right? You can say, hey, I'm the first one using this. Um, don't count out HTTP yet. I, I told you, right? Once you take away the power constraint, once you take away the limited bandwidth constraint, HTTP might just work fine. All what's left is how can you use HTTP in some more efficient way in a, in a kind of like pops up um, uh, uh, fashion. And there are, there are attempts out there providing pops up like uh, semantics and, and, and patterns on, on, on top of HTTP. There's FAYE, there's webhooks, a very simple method. Uh, pops up hub, there's simple thing protocol. You know, those are, those are things you should look at um, because you can always use one of the more fancy protocols later, but with HTTP at least, you're, you're, not, you're not betting the house on a technology which may or may not be like Betamax or, uh, what was it, Blu-ray versus, uh, yeah, exactly. Um, also, you can look at uh, some of the, of the service providers there in, by now. Uh, this is just a small little uh, group of companies I actually th thought were very good. Um, of service providers out there who will do the communication layer for you, right? Um, Verdata was started by a group, uh, formerly Alcatel, so they, they know Telco. Zively is the granddaddy. Uh, it's a company which was called Patch Bay in its old times, then went through various variations once they got purchased by LogMeIn. Uh, Bug Labs is a very, very interesting, uh, small, innovative team. They actually realized that a lot of people were using uh, Twitter for doing machine-to-machine uh, -machine communication. So they created a Twitter for machines called Dweet IO. It's a very slim, very kind of simple protocol, but hey, if it gets the job done. Um, PubNub, very, very uh, aggressive, very innovative uh, uh, company. 
posting tons of tutorials just to kind of get you excited about what you can do with their with their network, and then Exocyte that's actually one more one of the more industrial strength uh, service providers out there for more like the M2M uh, kind of uh, applications. And that concludes my slides.